The other day I made a video discussing Jeremy Hunt's plans to use pension funds to fund UK startups. That video was a reaction to the news, but since then, I've dug a little deeper. What are you hoping for ITB as your outcome from us here at the Financial Conduct Authority, Damien? We'll get into the conversations I had with a number of regulators in a second, but through those chats and going through this document as well, I can give you further details on the companies involved and most importantly, the significant cost in terms of fees. Loads of fees. So that hopefully then means you're more informed because getting an answer out of anyone involved is basically impossible. Okay. okay, so the TLDR for those who missed the previous video, Jeremy Hunt's Mansion House reform set out the biggest changes to pensions in over a decade. The key plan is to ask pension providers to take 5% of the funds they have and put them into high growth illiquid, which means you can't get the money back easily, UK startups, which is a very risky strategy indeed. This will affect millions of people in the UK of working age in the auto-enrolment work-based pension, the ones where you pay in and your employer pays in. There's a 70% chance that these changes will affect you if you're part of that scheme at work. They've done studies, you know. So far, the following companies have signed the compact, as it's been called. Aviva, Scottish Widows, LNG, Aegon, Phoenix, Nest, Smart Pension, M&G. Just ask your HR department at work who your pension's with, but those pensions make up about two thirds of all the DC pensions in the UK. Now, it is important to say that these changes are voluntary. The Chancellor is not forcing the companies to do it. But the fact that they've signed up and the positive response from some of these firms suggests that, you know, they welcome these changes. Why would they sign up if they weren't keen? Aegon UK is proud to be a founder signatory of the Mansion House Compact, which will help deliver long-term better outcomes for our pension scheme customers. Better long-term outcomes. In this document from the Department of Work and Pensions, please strap in because this made my blood boil, the document analyses the potential impact of the reforms and concludes that over 30 years, we would expect to see slightly higher returns. Why is everyone then hailing these changes as the second coming when the DWP thinks that they will only move the needle slightly? I wonder if it has anything to do with this section. We recognise that a fee structure of 2% per annum plus performance fees of 20% for performance above 8% is a common charging structure across the private equity industry. Those fees are disgraceful. They actually modelled the returns that Jeremy is promising everyone on a 1% fee as they say they might be able to get them cheaper. So Jeremy's promised return is based on a lower fee than the industry average, but we will come to his promises in a second. Let's just run with this 2% fee for a sec. Jeremy's saying that these changes could generate 50 billion in funding for startups. This 2% fee takes a billion off the top of that straight away. They then do that on an annual basis because it's a fixed 2%, straight into the hands of the middlemen that are moving the money around. There's also the 20% on any gains above 8%, but you know, performance related bonuses, they do a good job, they get paid. I can stomach that a little bit more, but the 2% fee is massive. What happens if they make losses? Are you paying those back? Or are you just being given license? No, being paid to gamble with other people's money into speculative companies. What annoys me the most about all of this is the application to DC pensions, defined contribution, where what you get at the end is defined by what's left. If the government's so convinced that UK startups are such a good bet, why are they not throwing the defined benefit pension schemes into this as well? Or is that maybe because they know they're on the hook either way with those, so they don't want to risk it? I tell you what, Jeremy, Give me your defined benefit, taxpayer funded, politician's pension, I'll go the casino with it, charge you 2% just to walk in the door, and any money that I make, I'll take 20% of that as well. How does that sound for you? Yes, sir. Oh. The happy clapping praise and the way in which these pension providers just bent over and signed up to what is a politically motivated portfolio is staggering to me. Jeremy wants growth in the UK and he's willing to roll the dice with pension pots of the future to get it. And it'll be long gone by the time we get to figure out if it was a good idea or not. But it's these pension providers who have the most to answer for, as they have a fiduciary duty to their clients to ensure they act in their best interests. And the only thing that we can certainly say about these reforms at this minute is they will increase risk and they will increase fees. The parade of praise around this, when the details are so loose, to my mind shows that these providers are just in it for the fees because there are so many questions that still need to be answered before anyone could possibly say, yeah, this is a good idea. I'll sign on the dotted line. How are UK growth assets defined? What will be the liquidity, valuation cost differences and implications to pension fund members being asked to invest in unlisted assets? Is there enough in the way of high quality unlisted investment opportunities in the UK for an additional 50 to 75 billion to be invested in? What evidence is that the unlisted assets will deliver higher risk adjusted after fee returns and therefore justify a higher allocation in pension portfolios? 
So exactly what did he say? Those are all great questions from Chris Smith, who is the investment manager at Jupiter. And if Jupiter, an active fund manager with 50 billion under management, is asking, where's the proof that this is a good idea? Well, I'm saying that that proof probably isn't that easy to find. Another thing I've really wanted to find an answer to in the last few days is how Jeremy Hunt can say something like this. More effective investments by defined contribution pension schemes will also increase savers pension pots by up to 12% or as much as £16,000 for an average earner. That to me sounds like a promise of returns that without any adequate explanation of risk. And I was just wondering how the FCA viewed that. Can politicians Where make sure... Where did you come across this? It was on TV. This is Jeremy Hunt. I've been on a wild goose chase. Welcome to the Financial Conduct Authority. Welcome to the Pensions Regulator. Thanks for calling the Money Help Scams Line. Thanks for calling Toby Carvery. Looking for an answer to a very simple question. I want to understand how the regulators sit with that when people have been taken from low risk or lower risk products into higher risk products and then are being told that there's only upside potential to that. The FCA themselves state, if you see a financial promotion or advert that is unclear or misleading, you can report it to us. So I did. Now, at first it looked promising. Please place you on a hold so that I can get the appropriate guidance and next steps for you, okay? Yeah, no worries. But unfortunately, the outcome was... We don't deal with this, speak to another body instead. Oh, right, OK. How can I help? He couldn't. In fact, a running theme across all the calls I made was, oh, sorry, we can't help with that, so you need to speak to these people instead. Contact number for a free and impartial organisation. Telephone number of the... Pensions regulator. Mm-hmm. 0345. Now, I finally ended up with the pensions regulator, which regulates work-based pension schemes in the United Kingdom. I mean, that sounds pretty good to me. That sounds kind of like what we want. Like the rest, though, they just try to back me off. Okay. The, the pensions regulator, we're not able to provide guidance I understand. or advice. The, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not really looking for guidance. What I want to know is, it, you know, I worked in financial services in the past, and if we made promises yeah. of returns through advertising, yeah. we would be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. So how can a politician make a promise of such returns? I just want to, I want to understand who holds them to account for promising that everyone in the UK is going to get an extra £1,000 a year in retirement because of the changes they're making. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So what I will do is I, I'm just going to check some information, if that's okay, and i put you on hold for a moment. Would that be okay if I did that? That's okay, yeah, of course. I've listened to a lot of whole music today. I wish at this point I had some good news for you, but in their attempt to just all get me off the phone and fob me off, they all seem to come to the same conclusion as the, you know, the solution to my problem here. Reach out to your local MP, contact your um, local MP about this. We, we as a pensions regulator, we regulate pension schemes and those who are responsible for running them. They regulate the pension scheme and the people responsible for running them, but Jeremy Hunt's reforms, which mark the biggest changes to how pensions are run in over a decade, that doesn't count. To speak to my Conservative MP about what a Conservative MP has said doesn't seem like a good way of tackling what is an over-promise in terms of returns. What I would like to know is what regulatory body in the UK oversees the promises that are made like they would with a financial institution. There, yeah. must, there must be someone yeah. that I can speak to. Thanks for calling Toby Carvery.